Doubted to believe it. It's been a, only about a minute, and it's been a very somber minute because our beloved Reds are nowhere near the Reds that we've known them to be for the past two to three seasons. They're not the Premier League winning team. They're not the Champions League winning team. They're not even the top four chasing team that they were in Klopp's first uh, full season or second season some years ago now. And to discuss what, uh, well, basically how we're feeling as Liverpool fans, I would imagine, is Peter the coach, Kofinas, a somewhat deflated Peter, much like myself and many of other Liverpool fans. Peter, how are you on this uh, this uh, muggy Sydney evening? I mean, right now, personally, I'm fine. I'm good. I just had some nice dinner. Um, obviously, we're talking together for the first time in a while as well, which is, is always good, you know. But if you're asking me how I am regarding Liverpool, well, I've, I don't know, like, <laughs> the emotionless is probably the, the best way to put it. Like, cold, uh, broken, I don't know what, what other words can I say. <laughs> uh, numb, numb is probably the best word, actually. I feel numb. Um, it's, uh, obviously, I've been through the Roy Hodgson eras and we've been through all, well, Growing up, I started following Liverpool when Julia just took over. So around that era there when I was old enough to remember Liverpool. Um, but this is, for me, even though we've seen some bad stages in our our lives, for me, this is one of the most disappointing and, and terrible times as a fan, purely because we have a top three manager worldwide. We have a starting 11, well, we have a squad previous to injuries, of course, that is can toe to toe with anybody in world football right now is the best eleven in the world. But the fr- best front line that we've seen at the club since, oh well, god, a very long time. Like, you know, I mean, we've had the best centre back we've had since almost ever, and the best centre back in the world, right? Obviously, and then best goalkeeper in the world, and best right back in the world, and best defensive midfield in the world, and all these, all these bests. And then what we're seeing is a team. With no spine, no fight, no no drive, no will to win. I don't know. It's it's really hard to describe at the moment what we're seeing on TV. You could almost say that maybe this team has been that depleted that even now, when they were chasing last minute wins like against Aston Villa last season, when Villa would score in the 85th minute, but we'd say, cool, no dramas. We'll just score two goals in the last five minutes and we'll win the game, which is what we did. Like, we're not seeing that with this team. Granted, we're missing a lot of the players that led to our success last season. And I I always used to be of the thought that, well, you know, you can lose a player or two, but you should still be ready to to take it on and go forth. And we saw with Man City last season when they lost uh, Emmerich Laporte that, Basically, they sort of like, not crumbled, but they were nowhere near their best either because they had to rejig their squad. Their midfield had to change. For B- uh, uh, Fernandinho had to move from defensive mid to the centre-back roles and they had to fill some other spots and they also had players in and out then. But, I mean, I, I, I personally do not know of any first, you know, first-class team with the likes of us in the Premier League at least who have suffered – injuries to basically five or six guaranteed starters or the spine of their team to your, your two starting, you know, premiership champions league winning center backs. Uh, you've also had to pull your midfielder out of position and play center back. And he's had his own uh, injury issues throughout the season. You've had your third choice center back, as we call Matip, you know, acting like a, uh, a wet cardboard, always injured as well. And, you know, he's out for a while as well. Henderson's had to be pulled from from his midfield position and play centre-back at times. We've had to blood new centre-backs into the squad. We've also had to rejig our front three because Jota ended up getting injured again. I'll never live it down for for playing in a, in a nothing game, had a knee injury, which is finally back now, which is good to see. And other players came back from injury. But all the same, the front three haven't been able to play the same. The midfield is always rejigged. And you're sitting there scratching your head thinking, like, what Liverpool team am I going to get today? And if the last six home games anything to go by, it doesn't matter who you put out there for Liverpool. You could probably have our starting 11, strongest starting 11 back once again. And we still maybe be struggling at the moment because it just seems that when we play at home, uh, even, even away in some cases, we just have nothing going for us. And it's not like we're getting absolutely pummeled in some games. 
if we consider some of the losses that we've had, um, you know, we, we had a one nil loss against Brighton. That was, that was a bad one. Before that, it was uh, the one nil loss to Burnley at home, which really broke the seal. And that, again, that could have been a game changer had some things gone our way in that game. And then since then, it's been the one nil loss at home to Brighton. Uh, we were waxed by Manchester City, albeit their goals were scored late um, in, in the game. Still, um, away to Leicester, we're one nil up. We absolutely capitulated in that set, late in that second half as well. Uh, we had a two nil win away at Leipzig, which we're playing them this week in the Champions League. A two nil lead at home at Anfield usually means you've got no hope because we're going to score another two or three. But even now, I'm not so confident in that progressing. And the 2-0 loss in the derby, Everton's first win and Liverpool this century. Yes, correct, this century. They had not won in, what, 20, 25 years or something something like that, something ridiculous. And, you know, um, the 1-0 loss to Chelsea and the 1-0 loss to, to Fulham just the other day. So it's not like we're losing these games 3 or 4-0. But these losses still compound, they compound, and then eventually it comes to a point where you say, okay, well, where do we draw the line? What is the situation then? What what are we missing that we were doing previously? Because it, it's not like we're, we're in the absolute shitter. Like, in a way, we are. I mean, if you look at it, the table basically says that we're sitting in eighth position at the moment, which is realistic for where we are right now. We've had 12 wins, we've had seven draws, but nine losses. So those losses normally would either be wins or draws at the least. So something in the meantime there has clicked and as this team has just completely switched off and nothing is going their way, particularly at Anfield where we had a fortress for, what, some 68 games, four years, a roaring 55,000 at Anfield, and now we've got dead silence there and all of a sudden we are losing games by one goal. I'll go back and say... Regardless of the injuries, the starting 11s we've put out have been strong enough to beat these bottom six teams that we've been facing anyway. So regardless of the starting level we put out, we shouldn't be losing to Southampton. We shouldn't be losing to Brighton. We shouldn't be losing to Fulham. We should be beating West Brom. We should be beating Newcastle. Uh, we should be beating Fulham twice, but we didn't. We haven't beaten Fulham this year. Um, we should be beating Burnley. Uh, so... I'm sick of hearing about the injury thing when our starting eleven is still strong enough to beat these these bottom feeders. Now, against your Chelsea's, your Cities, I'll even throw Everton in there. Um, all right. I don't expect to win when we're this depleted. I don't. Honest to God, I don't. But, you know, even Leicester, for example, even though we're up 1-0, I was thinking of that game, I thought, you know what, we're lucky to win here. Um, but against the others that we've been playing, and you can't tell me that the teams we've been putting out aren't strong enough to beat them. Now, I get it when, obviously, when you're shifting players around, the rhythm is not the same, and every player doesn't can't play that role of the previous player and execute it as planned. I'm like, I'm not stupid. Like, I get all that. But individually, we're still miles ahead of the ones that we've been playing, but we're not beating these teams. And for me, there's a problem there. And I think the problem is is mentally. I think mentally we're fatigued. I think we're mentally we're just, like, just done. Um, I think Klopp's run out of ideas, to be honest, because even you look at Fulham, it's like every time we got the ball, you could, you, you know what was coming. Like one or two passes, kick him behind. One or two passes, kick him behind. It's like it doesn't <laughs> – as it worked since we, for about a year now, since we came back from COVID. Because like, that's when it all started. It wasn't – don't look at Van Dyke's injury and, and Allison being injured 42 times and, and the Gomez. It started when we came back from COVID. That's when it all started. And we're lucky that we're you know, a million points in front when we came back. Because if we had to play an extra 10 games, who knows? Who knows? Because it's, it's been happening for a while. I think people have some – I get it. Again, I get it. The injuries are huge. Like, look at the personnel and look how many players have been injured for so long. Like, it's not normal. It isn't normal. But this has been coming for a while. And I think at the same time, where to blame – when we were in positions of power to strengthen after winning Champions League, Premier League, and, and not signing plays in the key areas that we were clearly missing, which at centre-back, like, I don't know why we'd sell Lovren and Hover and not replace them. I don't know why we'd rely on Matip's uh, health to stay fit for a season. We know it's not possible. So 
you look at all these things and you go, why didn't we bring in people in these positions? Why didn't we bring in a nine when clearly we need help in that role to give Firmino some rest because he's overplayed. And Jota was a great signing, but Jota is not your nine. Jota is your one that helps Mane and, and, and Salah rest. You now we bring in Minamino, who's absolutely quality, and we loan him out. Like for me, I think a lot of the stuff that's happening is self-inflicted at the same time, along with all these injuries. And I think that's the part that hurts me the most. And I think I still stand by this. There should be a statue built or club outside everybody's house who supports Liverpool. But I look at him and I think to myself, okay, you need to do something different here. It's not going to work. So why not try and use the bodies that you have to try and change the shape at least you don't have to try and change the shape to, to win the games, but try and change the shape to not lose the games because we're not winning games and we don't look like winning games. We're not getting shots on target. We're not taking shots at goal. We're leaking like a, a cracked pipe. Like it's, it's something that, it, for me, something needs to change. And I think it needs to refresh in things by, say, for example, I've seen a lot on the internet in terms of Twitter and stuff where um, a lot of people are suggesting a four two three one, and and I know George would love that, by the way, but I agree with it because then you only need two midfielders out of all the ones that are in and out of injuries. So you can play Fabinho and Thiago, for example, side by side. You can play Genie and Thiago, and you're giving Hendo the rest that he needs, and you're giving Fabinho some extra rest. And in front of them, you can play Shaq, Jota, Firmino, and you rotate the other guys around. And if you kept Minamino, which, again, don't ask me why or, or God knows why, but you put him in those positions there and you put Jota up front, Mane, Salah, or you put Man- uh, Salah up top as a nine, Firmino behind him, Jota one side, and Mane the other. Like there are different things that you can create with and, and, and be different and try something because we're at that stage now, Nick, where we've got nothing to lose. Like we look like finishing eighth. And then, so why not just play Davies and, and Phillips at centre-backs for the rest of the year because that's why you fucking went and signed Davies anyway. So just play the two of them, put Fabinho back where he belongs, and let's see what we can do because, like I said, there's nothing to lose now. We're not going to make top four. I still believe we're not going to make top four. We're lucky if we make Europa League, which I don't want to make anyway, so I'd rather have an empty season next year and focus on some domestic cups and rebuild. But if it gets any worse, we won't be able to bounce back as quick as everyone's thinking. This is like going to be a two, three-year process again where we go back to the top because Champions League funds will be disappeared. And again, Klopp says, I want players to play for Liverpool, not come for Champions League. Okay, I'll get that. But guess what? Sometimes that's the difference between them signing for us or signing for City. So I get what your, your philosophy, and I'm not going to take him if he doesn't want to come, but I don't think we're in this position now where we can play that game. Like, we need the best players to continue to keep up with City. Otherwise, it's game over for another couple of years. Well, in saying that, then, what do you think is the case then? Because we know Klopp's not not stupid. We know he's a very smart manager. We've seen that he's had success with Mainz. He's had success with Dortmund. Now he's had success with Liverpool. So what, why is it that do you think he's not sitting there thinking, all right, well, this four three three formation isn't working at the moment. We need to change things up. I need to rejig my midfield. Do you think that from from maybe um, Linders as well as, um, as Bovats as well, maybe he, he's getting different information? and he's maybe persisting with it? Do you think that he actually still believes in, in the system that he plays? Is it maybe the personnel? Maybe he doesn't think he has the right personnel to, to play a different formation because we've been so ingrained with this 4-3-3 counter-press, press you know, uh, system tactics we've been doing for three or four years straight. It almost does feel like we've completely burnt out. And just back to what you said about our form even um, during COVID, listen back to those podcasts that we did after we came back, and I think when the season started, yeah, I hundred percent. You will hear yourself saying that we have not been the same since COVID. Something has changed. You will hear yourself saying that. So, hundred percent, you picked it up straight away. Maybe so many others picked it up as well. And when you are missing some players, key players, mind you, yeah, it, it does make it a little bit harder. But I agree again. The the starting eleven we put out, we should always be winning. And if we can go through a Roy Hodgson era where we're playing with Konchesky. Babble up front, Paulson in the midfield, you know, a, a semi-injured Fernando Torres, Dirk Kout running the lines, Gerard trying to pull strings from behind, you know, 
it wasn't even this bad at home with Roy Hodgson than what it is now. And I don't think it's Klopp's a bad manager or he's doing something wrong. It, it might maybe is something as simple as these players have just had it and they just can't do what they normally did. And teams are now finally realizing, well, hey, they're not going to give us a full pelting so we can just do what we do and, and, and nick something and then park it and just defend and see out a game and get ourselves a, a big win. I go back to the days of two games. That said to me, was enough to see that we're in trouble. Two games. Atletico Madrid and Everton, the first game back from COVID. Those two games, I knew were in shit because it was kind of the same blueprint. And what that did was it gave every other manager the idea how to play against us. So for me, you know there's a problem when Scott Parker comes to Anfield and outplays us. Like, like Jesus Christ, like two of their players' wages is like, like you know what I'm trying to say? Like there's like Van Dyke's wages is probably covers half their team. Mm. Like we are that much bigger than them, and they come to Anfield and they outplay us, and no fear by the way, because they're confident that they don't block the spaces in behind, be compact in front of the box, and what are they going to do? Give it to Trent so he can cross it every time. Like it's something for me that it, it's Klopp's big. The biggest criticism of Klopp in his career has been his stubbornness towards his players. So like he, he's always. I know that I'm not going to bring up that whole thing of the Dortmund days. Oh, he's redoing Dortmund because I don't think he's redoing Dortmund because in Dortmund he didn't have six million injuries in one year, and I think he's got enough self. Um, self-awareness to realise that he's learnt from that situation. But in Dortmund, in those final couple of years where he went to shit, was he had overplayed certain individuals because they were there for him during the times that they were successful. And he didn't really freshen that bit up. And it came back to bite him in the ass. And I think that's happening now to an extent. And if you look at the team across the board as a whole, even with our strongest team possible, if you look at the bench, it's still not that strong when you're trying to bring on Origi and, and some other people there. Like, it's, I don't think there's enough. Like, Trent's biggest competition is Neko Williams or James Milner. Like, if you look at Van Dyke's biggest competition, other than Joe Gomez, it's Matip. Robertson's biggest competition is Simikas, and we haven't seen anything of him. Amina's biggest competition is no one. Salah's biggest competition is Shakiri. Mane's biggest competition is. Let's just say Jota for argument's sake. Okay, fair enough. But other than that, th- where's the competition for our players? And I think that's why they look flat and that's why they're going to be a little bit complacent because they always know they're going to play. The same 11, the same one, bar maybe one midfielder, wherever now and then come in. But I just think that we need to freshen things up and if we want to make these players snap out of this rut, we need people to come in and challenge them. I mean... <laughs> We've lost some games on fine margins, and that's what it comes down to. Football, you know, if you want to break it down and get into the minutiae of it, is is fine margins. But again, in saying that, in some games we haven't played badly. It's just we've had nothing hit target, nothing's gone our way. And again, that goes to show, okay, well, how are we approaching these games going forward? It's one thing to say, oh, we hit the post and then they conceded, a, 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 oh, sorry, then they hit us on a counter attack and we scored. It's another thing to be one nil up. And still pushing high forward, playing a high line against a team who you know play on a counter attack like Leicester, because that's how we got done for one or one or two of those goals. It was simple things like that where you're one nil up. Okay, I get you want to maybe get a second goal, but sit a little bit deeper. Let our players put something in the back of the minds of the opposition. Playing at home, yes, you are going to be taking the front foot, you are going to be putting pressure on your opposition because you're at home. You're expected to go forward, playing the opposition's half. But when you're just passing the ball around left, right, center, back to the back, go to the left, cross, blocked, back out again, all right, start again then. Back to center back, back out wide, cross, block again. It becomes repetitive. And the opposition's like, man, if this is all that they're going to do, we're going to get it. We're going to get something, no problems, because we're going to slip out of concentration, something's going to go astray, and all of a sudden we're going to see ourselves with the counterattack uh, on, on the other end. But, I mean, for us to be 
get beaten on counterattacks, it's not what happens because we used to beat teams on counterattacks because we used to see a little, little bit deeper. I mean, six games without a win now, it that's nothing. Yeah, it, it, it's not nothing. Who the hell saw that coming ever at all for this team after they were fantastic last season and the season before with the Champions League? I don't think anyone saw five, six. I don't even think anyone saw maybe a loss at home this season. Uh, uh, in the form that we were in, but it's happened and we go down a goal and then our heads go down as well. And then we just crumble and fall to pieces. And you can't be sitting there thinking like, well, you know, we used to be able to come back against other teams back in the past, but you know, you're playing against other, other with other players in that moment there. And you know, when, when you're looking at the table as well at the moment, I mean, there, there's a little bit of uh, smoke coming up underneath Liverpool because the, the fire is there. We're not, um, we're not exactly safe in any sense of the imagination. I mean, we're we're eighth. We're 43 points. We've got Villa behind us on 40. Tottenham are above us in seventh on 45. And you know, we've played uh, a, a game uh, two one too many, and Villa have got two catch up games. So, what's what's there not to say we're going to be you know. Yeah, with Arsenal trying to finish mid table in some aspect. Look, for me, this whole Champions League run, like, I, I, 2 0 up for me, for example, is like, well, anything can happen now. But if I'm an Anglesman, I look at this game, I think we can easily score three. It's not that I've given up on the club, it's that I just don't know what to expect anymore from what we've seen. I mean, if Fulham can come to home and, and just outplay us, then, then I'm sure that Red Bull Leipzig can score three. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm trying to say there in, in, in a way? Like, it's, it's almost like now, I, think, I don't think the players not to expect from each other. Yeah. They look around and I think it's all like, oh, you do it. Or no, you do it. Nah, coming by, you do it. No one's actually taking the game by the scruff of the neck because they haven't had to face this much adversity and they don't know what to do with it. And like I said, I haven't given up on them. Don't get me wrong. Like it's just I hate waking up, to be honest with you, watching them. But I do it anyway. And they ruin my week because I'm tired for the next two or three days. Because obviously in Australia here, we get the worst times on earth. And I'm never going to stop watching this club. But it's just like, when's it going to stop? Like, when's it going to, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, we have to come out of this soon or we are going to finish somewhere between, you know, 6th and 10th. It's not going to be a great, great look for defending champions. I think a lot of people have said we're, we've been the worst defending champions in history. And, you know, the, the facts don't lie. If we're going to go on facts, the, the facts are there for everyone to see. We're in eighth at the moment. We're nowhere near where we were. I think we're, what, 20 or 30 points shy of at this stage last season. Granted, we've lost some players. But in the big games, you can say, okay, fair enough. You know, we were outplayed by Man City. They had a full strength team, and, and even they got beaten by yeah, but you United. Know what? Even that game there, that one all was coming. Yeah, we were going to draw that game. They weren't going to win. Allison just brain fart two in a row, just absolutely shat himself and lost his bottle in, in, in that in that game there. Like for me, I thought we we're going to finish one all guaranteed, potentially even grab a winner, and then to do that back to back, and then do the same thing against Leicester, we we're guaranteed to win one nil. Mm. Just like like shit like that there. Like, it's not, you don't see it, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's one of the things as well. We're seeing players do things that we don't normally see them do, like Allison making the same mistakes, not once, but twice in the same game. And then, as you just said, doing it the week after again in certain moments. Players that we've brought in to replace our injured players are now injured again. Kabak is potentially, you know, coming back. Uh, well, Davis was injured two weeks ago. Who was, sorry? Davis was injured. As well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I want to know what's happening with our players being injured. If they're coming in fresh, what's to go? And of course, I, I think maybe not looking too much into this, but also the the word that our fitness coach or one of the um fitness and strength conditioning coaches that uh, they got. Uh, you know, sacked when when COVID hit or with the furlough, or whatever, and apparently that's when a lot of this started. I don't know how much you can read into that, if that is anything to read into at all. But obviously, people are going to try and and make something out of something to maybe justify the rut that we're in at the moment. But we do have good players. We know we've got skilled, quality players. We have 
top talent and when they're all firing they can be firing again but at the moment yeah against Red Bull we're 2-0 up as I said we can be 2-0 up uh, if this is last season I'm saying yeah bring it back you know we're, we're winning this game we're not losing this game now we concede what a goal in the first 10 minutes and then we're all sitting there thinking I might as well just turn the TV off now because I know what's coming I feel like this Champions League run whatever we're going to go on Potentially, it's just like that, um, like false hope for everybody because it's like the, the, the positive of the of like this squad at the way we are at the moment, anyway. Let's Champions League is a different place for us where we kind of like mentally it's relaxing because we're not in the Premier League anymore. And then all of a sudden, like we got this this new breath of fresh air because we're not in Premier League. For me, it's just like a walk in the plank. You just don't know when it's going to end, but there was, we're on the plank now. We've started walking. So, yeah, we'll get through Leipzig and then the next round and, you know, it could be Bay Munich or then whatever, you know. But that could, yeah, at the end of the day, we go ahead and win this Champions League, then Jesus Christ. But we are <laughs> definitely the biggest pain in the ass in world football because you can't do that to us. You can't do what you've done to us in the Premier League. It's Premier League. And then, <laughs> and then go win the Champions League. Like, what are you doing to us? Like, you, you're ripping us apart as it is and you want to do that? It's like we're all gonna gonna come together and celebrate again, but we need to get there first and foremost. And at the moment, based on home league form, that's not happening. But when you look at the the players that can potentially start against Red Bull Leipzig or even against Wolves, who we're playing at on Monday, you know we still oh. got Mane, Salah, Jota, or Firmino, Thiago, Wijnaldum, Jones. Um, you know, Fabinho is in there, or Kazak. Uh, uh, Kabak, sorry if he's. Back after his fitness, Robertson is still there. Trent's still there. You know, we've got Nat Phillips, who's just loves jumping at any ball in the air. And Allison, you know, what I mean, like we have a great squad on paper, and at the moment, it's just not ticking over to to make anything happen. And that's that's the conundrum at the moment. That's that's the Liverpool question. It's like, why is nothing working for us at the moment? And who the hell knows? Who's got the answer to that question? I'll finish on this. The whole home thing. The six, by the way, first time since 1892 we've lost six home games in a row. But this team, think about it. This team with this manager, that's unbelievable. But anyway, moving on from that, I thought, I don't like to count it as home or away because what the difference between home and away games is simple. People in the stands. So when you're at home, you've got your home support. When you're away, you're getting shit kicked out of you by the fans. So whilst there's no fans in the stands, for me it doesn't. I don't like to call it home or away. You're just playing on a different patch of park, uh, patch of grass in a different city. Really, if you look at it like for what it is, like for us to travel to, I don't know, first place that comes to my mind. Let's just say the Camp Nou, for example, right? Instead of playing in front of ninety thousand, you know, Catalonians just wanting us to, to die, pretty much. <laughs> it's, it's dead quiet. You're just playing in a patch of grass inside a cauldron that's, that no one is in. So you don't have that that hostility of, you know, when you make a mistake, they're on top of you or whatever, or you can feel momentum shift through the fans or whatever. Like, it's all gone. So that whole six losses at home, it's embarrassing. Don't get me wrong, Jesus Christ. But I know once there's people in the stands, that's never happening again for another, you know, 300 years. Like, it's, you know what I'm trying to say here? Like, I don't like to see, like, even this Champions League thing, Playing in Budapest again away, but it's the same ground we're at home. So do away goals count? If yeah. we score yeah, technically. Do you, know, do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. But what's an away goal now when we're playing at the same ground? No, just because we scored two in the first game, that's all it that's all that matters, because we scored two in the first game. That that's where it's at. But were, we, were we home first game or away? We were uh, away first game. We played in our away kit. Now now we're the home well, team we've second got two away goals. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm trying to say? Like, it's just stupid. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like, it's all, it's all backwards. And <laughs> I guess that's a byproduct of the current, current climate of world football and how everyone's organizing things. But again, this team really should not be where they're at at the moment. And we made the point of fans being important way back when, when fans were not in the stands. We thought that. Yeah, when people go to Anfield, they get terrified. They're like, shit, the Anfield crowd, the Anfield noise. It's not so much the Anfield Stadium. Like you said, it's just the grass within four walls. That's all it is with a couple of yeah. sticks on either end. 
but when that crowd is on top of you, when they're hustling, bustling, just you feel it, man. Absolute shit. I mean, you've played football. You're a coach. I, I, I've played football. I'm also a, a football fan. I mean, I've gone to derbies and grand finals and things like that. When you're the home team compared to the away team, you really, really do feel it. And crowds have played a big part in this season. And I'm not saying that's the reason why we are where we're at. But as you said, if there is a, a crowd at Anfield, even say 20,000, if we're going to go half capacity, even 20,000 people at Anfield can still make it sound like there's 50,000 people in there. Nick, Nick, we went on our winning streak with only 2,000 fans in the stand. Think about it. Yeah. At the start of the year, when we were first, a bit for that small period, it was when 2,000 fans were allowed in the stands and we went off. No one came near us. Just with 2,000 of us. Hmm. I think I'm reading into so, that a lot, but I mean, I know we can keep going on about this, and I know a lot of pundits have been hammering Liverpool. A lot of <laughs> former uh, players of of Liverpool rivals have been having a laugh and a chuckle, and Everton and all that sort of stuff. And look, it's always bound to happen. You can't say that these things will go on forever. I think it's just the manner in how they've happened. I mean, if we ended up, if we ever saw like an Everton loss at home. A, against a um, a uh, Roy Hodgson team, then you can say, okay, fair enough, it was a Roy Hodgson team, whatever. But against the team and the calibre that we've got for that to happen, yeah, there, there could be something much deeper underneath. And I think also breaking news just recently, there have been some rumours speculating and circulating around the internet that uh, Daimannschaft Germany are looking at Klopp as their new um, new coach for for the um, foreseeable future, and apparently Joachim Lowe is stepping down after this World Cup, so read into that whatever the hell you will. Yeah, well, good luck to him. We'll wait yeah. for that. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen, but you do know that you know, rumours will start floating around because that's that's the in thing at the moment. Well, if FSG they pull their, their, their fingers out and, and back Klopp, the only thing they went for Davies in Quebec because Matip was injured in January anyway, so... If they if they don't pull their fingers out and back club, what's stopping him from walking? I would if I was him. Yeah. I'd go for this again. No fucking chance. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure the FSG out brigade will have an absolute field day with that. Well, at the end of the day, you've got to back the manager. Clearly, look what he's done. He's changed our lives forever. Yeah, 100%. The man's a god. You've got to back him. 100%. You have to. And we still got to back our club because they are our club. And it's. And I'll go back to the meme of the old man sitting on the park bench all grumpy, but he's holding an umbrella over his wife and he's the one getting pumped with rain. And he says, just because I'm mad at you doesn't mean I don't love you. So, you know, we can be mad at Liverpool, but we can never hate Liverpool. We, we all love Liverpool FC. And Pete, I'm not ashamed to say I love you. Thank you for joining me for this um, uh, very... Um, uh, lifting of weight off the shoulders podcast, shall we say? Oh, good, brother. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we'll have some more in, in the coming weeks as well. We know we've been a little bit all over the place. It's hard to talk about your beloved Liverpool FC when uh, things aren't really going your way. But I thought it was about time we had to actually say something and you know, have a bit of therapy. And, and hopefully, you guys get some takeaway from this as well. So, uh, from myself, Nick, and Peter, thank you much for listening to this episode of the LFC Couch. Catch us on all socials at LFC Couch. And you'll hear from us on the next one.